Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. At the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester on the 13th of November 2017, the winners were announced of the sixth biennial Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting, after excerpts from all ten shortlisted plays were performed by a small company of actors. The winners of three judges' prizes of £8,000 each were announced as Tim Foley for his play Electric Rosary, Laurie Nunn for King Brown and Sharon Clark for Plough. Here is the moment when Chair of the Judges, Kirsty Lang, announced the winner of the £16,000 top prize. Now, this is what the judges had to say about the winning play. It points to a voice that we haven't heard before. Russell described it as fabulously mysterious with a lead character who leapt off the page. Lindsay Turner said she felt haunted by it. It was taut, tense, and atmospheric. Another judge described it as a drama that grabs you by the throat. The play begins with a stranger renting a spare room. (laughs) The lodger's arrival soon exposes a wound within the couple's relationship. The stranger is a mysterious, enigmatic young woman with an element of danger about her. Joni Kay is a compelling character, and it will be a great role someone to play. The play is Heartworm and the writer is Tim X. Glide. Do you remember that bit of the Oscars where they read out the wrong film? The other reason why this is kind of strange is because I've been working in this theatre for the last three weeks <laughs> doing the sound design for Jubilee. Come and see Jubilee. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to Brentwood, to the Brentwood Prize, the organisers, the readers, the judges, the actors today. Thank you so much. I really would like to thank my partner, Tanuja, who has, for the last few years, been my, my, third, my script editor on pretty much everything I've written. I'd like to thank some people who aren't with us today, who haven't been with us for a while. I'd like, uh, and as I said in the film, the feelings of some feelings of grief have been very important to the writing of Hartwell. So I would like to thank my father, John Atak, uh, my brother, Mike Atak, and my other mother, Daya Amara Surya, all of whom have in various ways contributed to me being right here today. Um, I miss them an awful lot. But then I'd like to thank my other father, CJ Amara Surya, and my mum, who's right over there. <laughs> she remembers um, the first play I did when I was seven years old. It made absolutely no sense and had two endings. <laughs> What's changed? <laughs> And I'd like to say that, I mean, this is, uh, I think I'm right in saying this is the sixth Bruntwood iteration, is that, is that right? I've entered five times. <laughs> and I'd really like to say to anyone thinking of putting in a, a play for this prize, it is worth every single time you enter into it, it is worth every bit of work you put into it. I was convinced that this play was, in some ways, the strangest thing I'd ever written. I was convinced that it was maybe kind of unfinished, that it had huge gaps in it, that it was a bit too strange to be considered, and look what happened. (laughs) Thanks so, so much. A couple of weeks later, once the excitement had died down a bit, I spoke to winner Tim X. Atak and began by asking him what the £16,000 prize will mean to him. It means the ability to focus in on some writing projects that otherwise wouldn't have happened. It means being able to consider, perhaps over the course of the next couple of years, not doing quite as much uh, sound design work as I might have been doing otherwise. And it possibly uh, means, I don't know, a new kitchen, something like that. (laughs) (laughs) So so practical and artistic considerations. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the whole lot. It's, yeah. (laughs) But it must give you a sense of being taken seriously and being able to concentrate more seriously as a writer, does it? I think it's one of the things that Brentwood definitely does, yes. Um, But I'm also aware of the fact that there's there's something that comes with that that is um, the investment that... um, 
Royal Exchange and the Royal Court making the productions is, is considerable and that there's, you know, a responsibility that comes alongside. And I'm really, really looking forward to working on that, <laughs> yeah. working on a production in those two amazing venues. And yeah, it does. Yeah, there's, there's, def- there's definitely a feeling alongside it that um, one, of the, one of the things that has been tricky over the last few years with the, with the plays that I've been writing and making is that an awful lot of them have the, uh, the kind of structures and um, aesthetics of, of what you might describe more as devised theatre. <laughs> they, sort, they, sort of um, they sort of have like sort of narratives that bounce around all over the place. They, they, it uses sound design as much as it uses performance to like sort of put across the ideas contained in the story. And what this does for me more than anything is that it it um, confirms for me as much as for anyone else that what I do is write scripts for the stage. <laughs> so I'm I'm really really happy with that. Yeah. Well, the play that won Heartworm. What's it all about? I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no. I, I genuinely have no idea. And I know this is kind of a, a an answer that an awful lot of <laughs> this is almost like a. A stereotypical uh, a writer's reply to this kind of question, but um, I, I know I know what happens in it, and I know what the what the story form takes, and all that kind of thing. But the way I wrote it was to write it as if it kind of had the quality of a of a waking dream, um, some you know one of those one of those dreams where you wake up either like sort of it's so close to real life that you wake up either disappointed or relieved that um, <laughs> that it wasn't it wasn't your life. So I wanted to write it like that, and I wanted it to have that kind of logic to it as well. I mean, rather than it being a kind of dream where where the dream supports the the dream images support some kind of wider story or wider thematic concern, I wanted it to have dream logic in the way that you know the films of of people like Yuri Norstein or Maya Deren do, or um, the film, well, more more close to home, things like Twin Peaks and David Lynch, that kind of stuff, where where there is a logic that drives it along to the to the um, to the surreality. And so I wrote it in a way that meant that I followed that. I followed that instinct rather than having a construct in front of me, rather than plotting out what was going to occur. <laughs> And so I, I sort of like followed that instinct no matter where it took me. I had no idea what it was going to be about, and, and I, I still in some ways don't. I could tell you probably what the uh, thematic concerns of it are <laughs> in retrospect, which I think it's a lot about loss and a lot about grief. But the story itself is, is, is a relatively simple one where um, a young woman rents out a spare room in a couple's house in, in a way that's very, very redolent of um, a certain website that I've no doubt we're all familiar with. And, um, and upon turning up, she tells them that the room that she's staying in used to be her room, which is kind of like a freaky little proposition that I really enjoyed. And then everything gets a little bit more complicated step by step from that point onwards. And the story takes us deep into the night and deep into like sort of the following morning and the sunrise the day after. And just the the idea is that just when you think you've got a handle on who this young woman is and what her relationship is to the situation, every single scene it shifts a little bit further in another direction and takes you somewhere else. At the ceremony at the Royal Exchange, uh, they did an excerpt, as they always do at the the Bruntwood ceremonies. They did an excerpt with a group of very good actors yeah, uh, yeah. of all of the ten shortlisted plays. So. That that was the first time I assume that you've seen your words from this play realised on stage. So what did that feel like? That that felt amazing. I mean, it's a it's a really a, it's a really incredible thing to do, like sort of kind of yeah extracts from all of those like incredible sounding and um, intriguing titles. I, re- I really felt for the for the actors and the director in terms of the kind of the kind of proposition that it was for them as much as anything, jumping between those worlds and having to give an impression of something in a, in a scant three minutes. I mean, you know, it's it's enough of a problem doing it in ninety minutes of playtime. But yeah, I, I I forgot that I was at that ceremony. <laughs> I was I was so I was so wrapped up in watching them. And I also had a very, a very, very good friend of mine, Sharon Clark, was um, also on the shortlist. 
and won one of the judges' prizes. And I remember watching, because I've talked to her quite a lot about her play um, over, the, over, the, over the years, and I remember turning and watching her as much as watching her, uh, her, the, the extract of her play <laughs> and seeing how delighted she was with it. And <laughs> it's quite something when you get playwrights to laugh at their own jokes the first yeah. time they hear them. That's, that's, quite, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> Well, I think when you're watching something that you're familiar with the basic material, yeah, if you're that close to it, but you you what you sort of laughing at people laughing at it in a way as well, aren't you? Yeah, you're laughing yeah, with satisfaction yeah. at people's reactions. Yeah, there, there certainly is that, and um, and there's also there's also the uh, uh, analytical part of you kicks in. I worked for quite a few years uh, with um, comedians. I worked for quite a few years, not as a stand-up comic, but in the field of stand-up comedy. And I remember the discussions that used to occur um, in the dressing rooms in the interval and after the show about the right kind of laughter <laughs> and the right <laughs> yes. correct forms of the correct forms of, of response from the audience, all that kind of stuff. But the aims that comedians go to the, 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 um, the sort of like the, the aims comedians have in terms of not just making people laugh, but also allowing it to achieve other kinds of results, other kinds of, uh, to give you other kind of weapons for later on in the show as well. So the part that part of me kicked in straight away watching the extract. <laughs> yeah. But at the ceremony, uh, we saw all the excerpts of the final 10. By the time it came to announce the winner, half of those 10 had already got some kind of a, uh, an award. So it, the, the odds were getting more in your face. <laughs> so when your name, when Kirsty Lang read your name out, what, what went through your mind then? Well, it wasn't, it was the, the, the format meant that it wasn't so much the name that came out as the, as when, when she uh, revealed the main proposition of the play. <laughs> yes. And I had, I had my mum sat next to me and the, some of the, some of the themes of the play are very, are very, very pertinent to what my family had been through in the last few years. And so I knew that there was going to be uh, an emotional kick to, and to if, if I got anywhere near any of the prizes, there was going to be an emotional kick to it of a kind that probably I hadn't quite experienced before. And, um, yeah, my mum confirmed that for me instantly. I think she <laughs> she she had a bit of a cry straight away, <laughs> which made me want to have a bit of a cry. Uh, um, so I had to I had to I, I sort of went into a space where I simply had to hold myself together when I walked up onto the stage. That was all that was going through my mind. <laughs> I was I was convinced that what happened was that I went up onto the podium and just paused constantly. <laughs> That's what it felt yeah. like. <laughs> it felt like a very calm, well measured speech. That's how thanks, it came across. Mate, thank you. That, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's nice to hear because yeah, and uh, obviously other people have told me that as well. But it's um, but it's good, it's good to have it confirmed because it did it did feel very surreal. On top of having been uh, working in that theatre for the for the previous, you know three or four weeks as well. Yes, of course. You, your other main job is, as you said before, as, as a sound designer, and you'd been working on Jubilee, which I'd seen, I'd yeah, seen the press yeah, night, yeah. the week before, and then I got the um, uh, the shortlist for the Bruntwood, and I thought, I'm sure I've seen that name in the programme somewhere. So you, that was that was sort of your home. What was Jubilee like to work on? Because that was very different, wasn't it? Oh, Jubilee was was amazing to work on. Jubilee was very definitely my bag. It was it was yeah. Uh, in terms of the um, the rehearsal process, was a very careful and considered one, and a, a just a joy to work on in terms of the uh, the nature of the different people in the cast and how much the production celebrated the people in that cast. I had a I had a really really great time on it. A very very different sound design to the ones that I normally do, and so and so it felt like it was a challenge for me as well. But a, but a really really great challenge. You know, there, there were there were different kinds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the ones that drive you up the wall, and then the ones that the ones that you just feel like um, you've been given a kick up the arse, and this was this was, yeah. this was the latter. Yeah. So now you must know the theatre quite well, and you've got the play that's going to be going on there at some point in the next couple yeah. of years. So what actually happens now? What's the process from now? Well, um, the process at the moment is that I'm, I'm, I meet up with Royal Exchange and the Brentwood organisers in um, in January, and we start talking about it. And that's that's as far that's as far as we've got so far. I mean, I'm. I'm sort of like a really, I'm really, really looking forward to discussing how we pull together a creative team for it, obviously. But beyond beyond the obvious task of having a play to make, then I, I think it's a, at the moment everything's open. Everything's open to suggestion. 
which feels like a great place to be in. <laughs> yeah. And there's a publication deal in that with Nick Hearn as well, isn't there? Yes, I believe so. And um, yeah, that'll, that'll be my first produced play, which is uh, sorry, first um, uh, published play, which is which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and with a company like Nick Hearn, which specialises in, in theatre books. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not uh, exactly a stranger to prize nominations for, for writing, though. You've, you've had quite a few for your writing for, uh, for stage, for screen. Yeah. You've written for radio as well. Uh, you must already have felt like you are a writer before this. Yeah, I've been I've been lucky enough to be in a, to be in a situation where I've I've had that confirmation quite a few times before from from external sources, from strangers and organisations that I that I don't know. But um, yeah, um, it's it's a funny one that I um, long pause. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I wanted to. I wanted. To, yeah, I was. Because I'm I'm pausing because I was thinking about about the value of these things beyond, beyond the obvious exposure and publicity that they give. There's obviously a boost to your confidence, but it's, but one of the funny things about it is that I've tried not to, I've tried not to get in a situation where the, the nature of what I've won for somehow defines what I do. <laughs> and that's, that's been, that's been an interesting one alongside it that, you know, it is very easy to think that you might have a kind of a formula <laughs> um, as a result of what's been picked out as being particularly successful. And I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I have my own company, Sleep Dogs, and Sleep Dogs um, has a kind of series of development processes that, we, that we've been following over the last decade or so that mean that um, I'm able to spend time developing what I need to develop in the way that I'd like to, as opposed to thinking that there is some kind of formula behind our working methods and there's some particular kind of, of um, when, when, when we have any particular kind of success, that leads to us doing more of the same. If there's, if there's one thing we haven't done, it's that. <laughs> we, we haven't gone, well, well, this is brilliant, so let's, 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 um, let's churn out a whole bunch more of it. So the, there haven't been sequels to the, the things that have won awards, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I noticed on the, the website for Sleep Dogs, you mention artists like Marina Abramovich, but you, you don't mention so much the theatre influences. So, so are, are influences more from, from performance art or other art forms? Well, I think, I think there are a lot from multiple art forms. And one of the things about the fact that we do so much, that we have done so much theatre work recently, as, as opposed more to the... the it's much more sporadic working on film and um, installation or stuff like that, which we're trying to we're trying to like sort of redress over the coming years. But what, one of the things about doing that is that you kind of like to subvert, <laughs> um, you kind of like to subvert expectation by by naming by naming sources and influences that are that are a, a bit more oblique. It's it's the way we think, so we we thought that's the way we ought to write it down. That's where we ought to cite it. I mean, we do have lots and lots of theatre influences, and I think the, the the principal one is just the Bristol theatre scene in and of itself. It's kind of a very, very incredible, well, it's an incredibly sharing community, one that is kind of um, uh, much less based on sort of like um, status and hierarchies and an awful lot of, um, than an awful lot of other places I might have worked in. And... That is, I think, probably the the principal source of our inspiration. It's just all the other theatre makers around us in this city, and then beyond that, there are there's our there's our favourite theatre companies and our, our people like um, Elevator Repair Service and Back to Back in Australia and all those all those kind of people. Yeah, but you've done more mainstream stuff. You've written for Doctor Who audio dramas as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's ongoing. I'm not letting that go. <laughs> sound like a childhood dream yeah it makes me really really happy there's there's a, yeah there's a there's a picture somewhere maybe with, with tom baker that just uh, i have the eyes of a five-year-old that's it's kind of um that that's been fantastic working with the big finish crew who who make an astonishing amount of material over the course of over, over the course of each year and have a really really um lovely like sort of setup going with the guys who um, in a lot of cases, used to be in the programme back in the day. And uh, it's it's wonderful to see them 
playing those parts. And uh, yeah, it's kind of that that stuff is that's been building up in me for the for the last you know like 35 years <laughs> those stories have been have been sort of like fermenting for you know for, for a good long time so they're a lot of fun to do because they kind of just pour out <laughs> so how much freedom do you have with something like this presumably you're, limit, you're limited on who's available if, you, if you're going to bring in a particular character well that tends to be that tends to be the start of the that tends to be the start of the invitation from big finish it's like sort of would you uh, how about writing for this character with this character and etc and then you kind of around that the process tends to be that you pitch a bunch of ideas that you'd like to see those characters thrown into <laughs> yeah. and then the producers um make a choice as to as to which one they'd like to go with and you get you get stuck in so yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but there, there are people who listen to all these, and if you make a mistake that clashes with something else in the Doctor Who universe, then then they know about it, don't yeah, they? It does, it does, other rules. Yeah, that's right. But luckily, luckily, the script editors. Uh, I mean, I thought I was a, I thought I was um, a Doctor Who geek. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. no. The, um, there are you know sort of uh, the, the, the sometimes the. Uh, the, the wonderful notes that come back on each script include stuff like Tim, you've you've mentioned that the TARDIS doesn't have spacesuits. Well, actually, always before, <laughs> it's it's great. I'm I'm in seven working with these guys. I really am. <laughs> so really, as a writer, you've got a pretty varied life because now you've got you're a officially you're a playwright now, award winning playwright, <laughs> yeah. and you you've got the. Um, the Doctor Who stuff, uh, which is very different, and then the the work that you do with with Sleep Dogs, where you can just sort of uh, create your own project whenever you want. So that's yeah. perfect position to be in, really, isn't it? It's a very good position to be in. The only worry is there's too too much, <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it's it's uh, that's one of them good problems, isn't it? But yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I'm sort of there's this part of me that's looking forward to perhaps focusing in my sound design work on what sleep dogs do over the, over the next couple of years and, and then allowing myself some like almost contemplative time on what might be the next writing projects uh, for stage and screen. So yeah, that's, that's what's on the horizon for me now. <laughs> You've had quite a, a long experience in performance yourself as a sound designer. You've worked in the different departments. You've lectured on sound design as well, I think, haven't you? Yes, I was a tutor on sound design at Bristol University for a, for a couple of years, uh, a while back, yeah, yeah. Do you think having that wider experience of different departments of theatre helps you as a writer? Yeah, undoubtedly. I think you. Um, I think what happens more than anything is that you end up, writing scripts that you would be excited by as a sound designer as a performer um as a director all those kind all those roles that I, that I've I've taken on in in different ways with different degrees of success over the years but it really it really does help to have even the most glancing experience of getting up and you know like delivering lines in front of a room full of people or you know like having even to the extent of thinking back to some sleep dog shows where we've done the lighting design ourselves as well, stuff like that. That's something where I, I, I like the idea that if I if I pick up one of my scripts, I'd be excited to be one of the people working on it. <laughs> yeah. So while you were writing Heartworm, did you have a sound design in mind while you were writing it? <laughs> not, not, not particularly. I tend to. This is one of the things about my script writing. I tend to try and avoid having definitive takes on anything. I, I don't mind using let's say the the idea of um a kind of an amalgamation of various actors in one role <laughs> i don't mind using using that idea whilst i'm writing but i don't allow it to take hold i don't allow it to um like sort of get its talons into me so that the only thing i can imagine is x actor performing that part and it's the same with sound i kind of write what i think are a series of interesting invitations to a sound designer that i think fit in with what i'm trying to communicate and then i, I leave it at that i don't like sort of i don't spend too long getting into it as it happens the the sound design in in heartworm is relatively um specific <laughs> Yeah, and and it's and it's the instructions for sound design are reasonably sparse. I've I've written scripts where there are a lot more 
intricate <laughs> um, and and require a lot more like sort of um, and I'm, I'm sitting there reading it and thinking oh yeah this is one of those scripts where the sound design is going to going to require a lot of technology all that kind of stuff Heartworm, Heartworm isn't one of those I think it could go either way I think it could be a I think it could be um, a real challenge for a sound designer, or it could be a very like sort of simple contemplative thing. Well, they've got plenty of money at the Royal Exchange. Yeah, so, well, yeah. throw it. <laughs> so what? Uh, what next? What? Uh, what have you got on, that you're working on at the moment, or uh, coming up soon? The, the next big thing is well, this this week we're working on a project for um, Sleep Dogs, which is um, an electronic musical. Um, it's uh, a musical about grief which sort of like connects in with some of the themes of Heartworm, but, but approached in a very, very different way. We're wanting to write a big, ecstatic, vibrant musical about grief, heavily influenced by people like um, Björk and Anoni and Nine Inch Nails, <laughs> all that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're working on that and we're chipping away at the story for that um, over over the next week. And we're hoping to make that maybe sometime over the next year or so. And then alongside preparations for some TV projects and stuff like that, um, for some TV drama, I'm, I'm writing, I'm heading to South Wales to write a, a novel, to sort of like chip away at a novel that, that I've had on the back burner for for like sort of like quite a few years now, which is a novel about um, five women who who get together and form a band in order to play one chord forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's been like sort of um, bubbling away for quite a while, and I'm just going to spend a week giving that some care and attention. And then next year, Sleep Dogs head out to uh, we're heading out to um, Sri Lanka for for a residency for about a big long big long residency about six weeks worth to um work on a piece for outdoor spaces that we last worked on in a live theater in newcastle so quite a contrast <laughs> right from newcastle to sri lanka well it's interesting because that's my that's um Tanuja, who's the other half of sleep dogs that's that's her um that's her background that's her family from sri lanka and she um, grew up in the northeast so it's not as it's not as weird a connect as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> for more information about the Bruntwood Prize, including lots of advice for playwrights, see writerplay.co.uk. Tim Atax company Sleep Dogs can be found at sleepdogs.org. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.